I'm Mike. I'm Jason. Welcome to Snake Envy. Today uh, it's February, and one of the most common things I see on social media right now is uh, questions about why people snakes aren't eating. So we're going to talk about some of the more common reasons, and uh, why don't you kick, a, kick us off with the one that is most relevant to right now. The, the, a lot of reasons snakes won't eat right now is because it's winter outside in the, um, North America here. Even though your room may be warm enough, they can sense outside what's going on. They can feel, they can sense low pressure, high pressure, storms, and a lot of that contributes to non-feeders, um, non-feeding this time of year. And there's many other times of year that they, snakes go off feed too. Like uh, in the fall, a lot of snakes will shut down early. Mountain king snakes are a big one. Um, there's a few others, but th those ones come to mind. And and a lot of milk snakes do too. And I and I think it's because some of that they live in higher elevations, and storms come in earlier, and the weather changes earlier. There, that's a theory, of course. But S snakes are wired to brumate. And we, particularly me as a hobbyist, I don't brumate my snakes. So in a way, I'm kind of fighting against their natural tendencies. Why others might just thrive, you know, year round. Yeah. And never skip a the beat. majority of mine don't miss a meal, but. Um, and then springtime is a weird time of year where males want to breed and they will stop feeding and they'll just wander they'll just circle the cages and and if so these behaviors you can be aware like if you're it's springtime march april may and your snake your male's not eating but the female's eating really well and you might know that your male is just cruising and he or if you just have a male he might just be cruising and they'll sometimes wear out their nose the scales on their nose and rub them get nose rubs yeah, they're, like they're so focused on females and breeding. They're just driven, yes. Food just takes a back seat. <laughs> and for beginners who have never seen it, I mean, what you're describing is perfect. They, they will wear a path around their enclosure. They will rarely be in their hides. It can last anywhere between two to four weeks, in my experience. Um, but they will tell you when it's over because... <laughs> They'll go back in a hide. You'll you'll see them in a hide again for the first time in three weeks. Yep. Now, what about neos? You being a breeder and you're dealing with neos and trying to get neos eating before you sell them. Uh, talk about neos and and sometimes they struggle in the fall because in the wild they may not eat more than a meal or two before they brumate. Correct. Yeah. Um, and some are just stubborn and and even even the common species like king snakes common kings um gopher snakes i have plenty of gopher snakes that are stubborn stubborn little buggers to get going um a lot of that is they react to smells and what you're offering them they're not going to want and so we're going to we're going to talk a little bit more about that at the end of the segment of uh, some tricks how to get stubborn feeders to eat but it's very common for a lot of colubrids not to want to eat i mean i even heard corn snakes not yeah. wanting to eat so and, and a lot of people don't think particularly beginners but if it's been six weeks since you got your snake in the fall and it, you've tried every trick in the book and it will not eat your best bet might be to brumate it even if it's just for six or eight weeks and then that may you know at the end of that brumation when you warm them up again they'll probably be raring to eat that usually will trigger it you know a m month or two three months if you want to and it's not going to hurt them as long as they have enough body weight on them yeah um they they haven't been eating anyway so you might as well give it a shot. Yeah, it, it's healthier for them to not eat while they're cool than, than to not eat while they're warm. It's a natural instinct. Yep. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about husbandry. That's one of the other reasons that typically snakes won't eat. And it sounds very cliche, you know, have you checked your temps? Or <laughs> that, that's always the first pe the question people ask. 
But husbandry, I think in the hobby today where we're dominated by care sheets and the internet and social media, I think sometimes the art of husbandry has been lost a little bit. And I think people are so locked in to the care sheet that they don't understand quite that sometimes you have to experiment a little bit, particularly for some individuals. So whether you're talking about a neo or whether you're talking about an adult, even you might have five king snakes and four of them are doing perfectly based on what the care sheet said or what the internet said or what your neighbor said, but you've got that one that will not eat. You need to experiment. So the first thing we recommend, if you own snakes, you must own a laser Temka. This is one of the most valuable tools. They're very inexpensive. So the first, the first advice I would give is double check that what you're seeing on your thermostat is actually happening in the enclosure. Um, I'm one of those people that I don't put my probes, my temperature probes, inside the enclosure. Snakes tend to move them around. Sometimes they poop on them. Um, I sandwich it inside my UTHs. Um, so because of the air gap in there, I already know that it's not going to be accurate at the, at the stat. What I've learned is it's about a three degree variance. So if I want 82 at the hot spot, I got to set the stat for 85. So use your temp gun, double check, make sure that your hot spot is actually what your thermostat says. Um, the other thing is, I don't think a lot of people really know their snake rooms well enough. Uh, we took some measurements here, and I've done the same thing in my snake room. And what, what variances did we find? From floor to ceiling, we had three degrees difference. Yeah. And that doesn't <laughs> sound like a lot, but you have a problem feeder, maybe move that thing from floor to up high on the rack, or vice versa, yeah. and try that a degree or two maybe all that it takes to get that snake to feed yeah and that's affecting your ambient temperature so even though everybody in this rack might have a similar hot spot your ambient is three degrees off for the guys up above versus below and if you have a an established good eater up top he's he's well established he recognizes food he's he's accustomed to eating he's probably not going to be bothered by seeing a reduction in temperature. But the snake down here at ground level who's not eating, that three degrees, like Jason said, could be all the difference. Uh, outside walls. In my snake room, I have an outside wall and then I have inside walls. I have two enclosures in my snake room that are up against that outside wall. When I measured in my room, uh, two degrees lower okay. in, the, in the winter this time of year, two degrees lower against that outside wall than it is on the other side of the room. So same thing. If I got a picky eater, I got one that simply won't eat. That two degrees could make all the difference in the world if I just switch places with another snake. Um, I think the other thing that a lot of beginners don't realize, it's intuitive to assume that if a snake's not eating, it's too cold. But it can be either. It can be too warm or too cold. Right. Um depending what kind of care sheet you're reading or have read. Um, a snake, they, a care sheet might want 80, 82 degrees. Well, and in fact, the snake might need to be 77. And that's yeah. all it takes. I yeah. keep, I try to keep my room here. My prime temperature is 78. That's what I shoot for. That's... But it does fluctuate. It fluctuates about six six degrees in a day on average, yeah. which I think is great because it mimics a nighttime drop somewhat. Yes. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention about um, picky feeders or non-feeders is sometimes, and a lot of you probably do this, but some of you may not, and you may be lacking just a place that is just a hide. Something makes them feel comfortable to then want to feed, and maybe you have to add more. Um, yeah, I don't think you can add too much, so to speak, but yeah. something simple as that can often get a snake to feed. They're just like us. They're just like our dogs and our other pets. They're all individuals. Some of them have different personalities. Some of them are real aggressive when they eat. Some of them are timid when they eat. 
And sometimes it's just a matter of figuring out the personality of one individual snake and what it prefers. Um, now that's easier for me than it is for you, where we've got 500 snakes in this room and you've got to keep track of three or four that like things a particular way. That's a lot easier for me to figure out. But that's part of that experimentation is just play with things and figure out what the snake prefers. And that leads us to feeding methods. Not every snake likes being fed the same way, even if they're the same species. Um, Tong, so tong feeding, that's kind of what everybody's taught to do, and that's what everybody's told to do, uh, particularly with frozen thawed prey. Put it on the th tong, simulate the animal being live. Um, for visually stimulated snakes, king snakes are a great example, they're visual hunters. Um, it's true, they usually are motivated by seeing that frozen thawed prey moved around, and, and it stimulates their their visual sense of, of wanting to go hunt. Um, but for some snakes, particularly if you have a top opening enclosure, having that prey come in and moving, and it can actually be scary. <laughs> and they want, it, they want to move away from it rather than move towards it. Um, so some, some snakes just don't like being fed on tongs. And it's okay to leave the prey in one spot and let them come to it. Uh, yeah. Now, in your case, I'm betting... Most that's mostly what you do is mostly. leave prey and Just go to the next and one. Yeah, go. drop and go. But it, there's some that I I know that I need. I know my I have 500 snakes. I know, believe it or not, I know which ones want yeah. and need to be tongue fed and which ones don't. Yeah. And sometimes it takes a little bit longer on the new babies and stuff to figure it out. And there's a there's a technique for a lot of neos that. It's called tease feeding, and you just kind of, we're going to have to show you an example of it, but you're you're putting this the pinky in its face, and it's kind of irritating, and eventually they'll bite it, and they'll be like, wow, this is kind of kind of good, so I'm going to decide to eat it. So Yeah, sometimes you, you bump them in the nose with it, yeah. um, and, and, it, and it might be a defensive bite, but it's what gets their mouth on it, and then they say, oh, this is good. Um, so let's talk about shy eaters. Um, you mentioned that some snakes like to be fed in the hide, and that's one example of being a shy eater. I have a northern Mexican pine snake, and if he had his way, um, every single meal would be delivered to him at the hide. Now, I try to get him out of his comfort zone a little bit, and so I mix it up. Sometimes I leave it right there for him. Sometimes I'll scent it there in front, drag it around the enclosure, and kind of make him you know, go and, and find it. And that's a good 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 way to stimulate, you know, some of his senses and some of his natural behaviors. But yeah, if he had his way, he would eat every meal inside his hide. Um, now, if that's the only way a snake will eat, go for it. Um, but in his case, he'll do both. So I make him do both. Um, but particularly Neos, um, oftentimes they just want to eat in a hide where they feel safe. Yeah. Either put it in their hide, or I, a lot of times I'll put it right outside their hide, so yes. just their head has to pop out, yeah. and they still feel comfortable. Yeah. And that way you don't have to disturb them to see if they did eat. Um, and some, yeah, some of them like, some snakes like small prey. Like, this yes. thing won't eat. I, but I know this snake can take it into old mouse, but it won't. And yeah. I've had adult four foot snakes I had to feed fuzzies you just pile a bunch of fuzzies yeah. that's what they're going to eat and they're just particular and even in terms of stimulation and in terms of just varying their diet that can actually be good for snakes you know give them a variety of sizes give them a variety of colors snakes snakes believe it or not can actually get uh locked in on white prey like they won't eat anything else and uh, that's one of the weirdest ones I've come across both personally and they just get fixated on those white lab mice and rats. And as soon as they see a black rat, they don't know what to do with it. And that and that's a good segue into different species have different uh, senses that they prioritize. We talked about king snakes being visual hunters. Uh, some snakes are locked in on, on smell. I think the pits are a good example of snakes that hunt primarily by smell. Um, I have a green tree python. When he was young, he's 11 years old now, but when, when he was young, his prey always had to be warm. 
So even if it was frozen thawed, I had to put it under his light for a little bit, or I had to put it in hot water uh, immediately before I fed it to him because it was all about his heat pits. It was all about warmth. Um, but now uh, that he's got accustomed to eating the same kinds of food over time, now he recognizes the smell. Now he recognizes what they look like. And so I don't have to do that anymore. Um, but in the early going, particularly, you might have to figure out what motivates either an individual species or an individual snake most to eat. Is it scent? Is it sight? Is it heat? Um, so again, you, sometimes you have to experiment. Live, frozen thought. Live. Um, live, obviously, is kind of a controversial topic. I believe in live feeding occasionally for stimulation. Um, I give my snakes live prey occasionally. They love it. Uh, it. It enables them to exercise some of those natural emotional and you know physical muscles of actually going out and hunting something. I don't do it all the time, but I do it a few times a year for each of them. But particularly for neos, sometimes that's all they'll eat. Right. I, in, the, in the beginning. I, am, I still have a few stragglers from yeah. 2000. 22, so always better they eat than not and sometimes you're going to have that one snake in your collection that you have to do everything different than you do your others and that's okay because that's how they eat um, one thing I wanted to point out too when we're talking about shy eaters brown paper bag this works really well um, and it's one of the tricks every snake keeper should have at hand Always save out one of your, your paper grocery bags. Um, if feeding in the hide doesn't do it, and if you still can't get your snake to eat, trying a variety of tricks, put the snake and the frozen prod, thawed prey in the bag, close the bag, and then put the bag in the enclosure. And if need be, you can leave it in there overnight. Eventually the snake will probably tip it over and find its own way out. Um, but this just in addition to what a hide offers, this just offers darkness and a little more feeling of security. And so if the hide doesn't do it, brown paper bag might. Um, now, we've talked a lot of, of, about basic things and some of the tricks that you can, you can rely on. Jason's gonna tell us about two, uh, one of which I'll bet most people have never heard of. And another one that is actually really simple, but how many people would think to do this? So let's talk about your two kind of fallbacks when nothing else works. Yeah, I mean, if they're not taking live or frozen thawed, and it's, and one thing, please don't stress out if it's only been a week. You know, right. these snakes can go months. Most snakes can go months without a meal, even right. their first meal. I've once had a Arizona Mountain King snake didn't eat till week or month eleven. Wow! And it caught up. I had to brumate that one. Yes. By the way, um, but it did catch up to its siblings even even with that long period. Um, On that same subject, though, I always recommend too to beginners: um, if a snake doesn't eat today, don't try again tomorrow. Don't try again the next day. If you're feeding weekly, wait a week. If you're feeding every other week an adult, for example, wait two weeks. Um, it, it just stresses you out the yes. more times they don't eat. You're wasting prey. I think if keep you're, them on their schedule. And if you keep offering it, they get used to that. And then they're, yes. you're just, you're beating a... It's almost not food anymore to them. It's just an annoyance. Yeah. yeah. And so, so it works against you. And it's very stressful. Yes. But let's talk about your two last resorts. Okay. So if I don't get them to eat live or frozen thawed, the first thing I'll do is wash a pinky. Live or frozen thawed, I'll wash it with hand soap, bar soap, or, you know, the gel. Um, and just scrub it up really good. And then rinse it really well and get all that residue off of there. What that does, it changes the smell of the animal. And that's what a lot of neos are triggered by smell. And by yeah. changing the smell, it might trigger them. I don't know why soap would work better than a domesticated rodent. I, I don't know, but it works really well. Yeah, I've I've heard of dish soap, powdered laundry soap, any variety of soap. Powdered laundry work. soap is one of the best. <laughs> believe it or not. 
it's a weird it's a weird thing to do to wash their prey, but it works. So I that's what I'll first try. I'll even try it. I I'll try it on the gray bands, and then and the mountain kings and a lot of stubborn feeders. I, if that doesn't work, then I do the same process. I'll wait two weeks. I'll do the same process, but this is what I have here. This is sand and lizard poop. What I did is had a 10-gallon aquarium. I went out and got six or seven lizards, sagebrush lizards, common lizards, kept them in there, fed them in there for a month. I would wash pinkies, throw them in there, and let the lizards crawl all over them, roll in the poop, in the sand, and that is magic a lot of times. Even after, well, this stuff here, this dirt and poop and sand is about eight years old and it still works <laughs> it still works so i haven't I don't whatever the magic whatever <laughs> whatever the magic and the smell yeah. is yeah. um by this by the along those same lines if you go to a pet store to either buy live pinkies or fuzzies or if you're buying adults that you're going to fresh kill i always recommend have them throw a little bit of the litter from the cage in with the animals in whatever container they give them to you it's the same principle it's just that much stinkier yeah. than the mouth than the mice right. themselves, and if they're kind of crawling around in their own poop on the way home, um, it just makes them that much stinkier and that much more appealing. So <laughs> it's eight years old, and whatever magic is in there, it still works. So we have a few others that are extreme too, but yeah, yeah, and and this is a topic that I know we'll come back to because feeding. If you think about it, for beginners, when you buy a snake, it's probably the first pet you've ever owned that doesn't eat every day. Right. So that's an adjustment in and of itself. And then when you can't get it to eat, whether it's weekly, every other week, it's really, really stressful. And it can kind of ruin the experience of having a snake. So I know this is a topic we'll touch on again, but uh, just know, as Jason said, snakes can go a long time without eating. Don't stress about it, and there's always ways to figure it out and get a meeting. Uh, please comment. Please like and subscribe as well, but tell us about your feeding experiences. Uh, give us your crazy tips that no one's heard of for getting a, a picky eater to eat. Thank you. Thanks, folks.